you ready, kids? Aye, aye, Captain! I can't hear you! Aye, aye, Captain! Who? Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? To say that SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom is a masterpiece of a licensed game would be one of the biggest understatements from the mid-2000s era. Many of us involved with the gaming side of media entertainment are plenty aware that the majority of third-party licensed games are among some of the worst shovelware that graces a video game system's lifespan. These games tend to be low-budget, low-polish, low-effort titles that only exist to cash in on something popular and earn a quick buck. These could be movie tie-in games, or games based off of a hit television series, or even trendy gimmicks. I'm sure you know the ones. It's pretty common knowledge that 95% of these games turn out to be shit. And sure, every once in a while you get a pretty decent game out of the mix, but dare I say no other licensed game ever has come close to the legacy that Battle for Bikini Bottom has garnered over the past 15 years. Except maybe the movie game, but that's built off the same engine by the same dev team, so I'll save my thoughts on that one for another time. Perhaps some could argue that the game's overwhelmingly positive reception amongst fans is due to the bar already being set at such a low standard that anything qualifying as a decent game automatically blows expectations out of the water. But I would argue that Battle for Bikini Bottom has so much more going for it than simply being better received compared to its competition. The game employs so many principles of game design that the majority of common licensed games tend to miss or flub up on, right down to the smallest details that both gamers and Spongebob fans alike would come to appreciate. This game is not a low-end, shitty product pushed out solely to make money. There is a genuine passion behind this one, and I can tell that the folks working at Heavy Iron Studios at the time were massive Spongebob fans themselves as well as competent game designers. This game has so many little nods and references thrown in that fans of the show would totally pick up on. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. SpongeBob Battle for Bikini Bottom was developed by Heavy Iron Studios and published by THQ back in 2003 for the Nintendo GameCube, PlayStation 2, and original Xbox. Although the game also saw a corresponding release on the Game Boy Advance and PC. I would spend time talking about the Game Boy Advance version, but um, let's just say there's a reason people only talk about the console version. The Game Boy game does at least have Mystery and Robo Squidward in it, but that's about all that's worthy of note. And as for the PC version, well, if you like Employee of the Month, you'll probably like this one too. So back to the definitive game we're talking about here. The premise of Battle for Bikini Bottom is relatively straightforward, all things considered. Basically, Plankton decided to build a gigantic robot army so that he could steal the Krabby Patty secret formula, but it ends up backfiring on him thanks to a simple slip of the mind. See, the evil genius forgot to switch his duplicated Tron 3000 settings off of Don't Obey, which, I mean, come on, anyone would do that, right? Why Plankton would even have that setting installed on his machine to begin with is beyond me, but the dude went to college, so he must know what he's doing. I went to college! Meanwhile, at SpongeBob's house, he and Patrick are playing a game called Robots and Racehorses while diving into a conversation about how they wish the robots were real. Patrick pulls out his magic wishing shell and explains that by putting something inside the wishing shell and shaking it really, really hard, duplicates of whatever is placed in said shell will appear the following morning. Hey, it may be a simple premise, but you don't usually play a 3D platformer for the story, and nothing is better than simplicity when it comes to something like SpongeBob episodes. I'd say this is a perfect fit. The rest of the game primarily consists of you traveling from level to level, collecting golden spatulas, and destroying all of the robots in your path. I really don't have much more to add besides that, the plot is relatively straightforward. There aren't too many cutscenes aside from boss fights and things like that, so... It's a 3D collectathon platformer after all, similar to something like Banjo-Kazooie or Spyro the Dragon, although I've seen some comparisons made to the Ratchet and Clank series as well, which is pretty interesting. If I were to determine the number one reason as to why this game, this game, is so beloved, I would say it's faithfulness. 
This game is a prime example of a new group of people observing the property, reviewing the property, learning the property, and creating something in tune with the property. I mean, let's be real. If you're sitting down to play a SpongeBob game, what do you want to see? Probably SpongeBob goofing off with all of his undersea friends, or iconic locations such as Goo Lagoon and Sandy's Tree Dome, cartoonish gags and a great sense of humor. And all of that is successfully packaged inside this neat little gem. You see, you're going to need to learn some new bubble blowing moves if you're going to journey to the ninth dimension and defeat the giant monkey man. Like, Bubble Buddy here could have just said, press this button to perform a move in a boring, generic, run-of-the-mill text box, but nah, the dev team decided to throw in an episode reference to Big Pink Loser, because why not? Battle for Bikini Bottom is chock full of these references to episodes to the point that you can find even the tiniest details that relate to the show pretty much everywhere you look. Whether it's screenshots from the episode Texas placed in Rock Bottom's museum, or Squidward's unsure face in SpongeBob's dream, there are references References galore, and any fan of the series would absolutely fall in love with it. You get to control three characters throughout the game, Spongebob, Patrick, and Sandy, with the latter two being dependent on the stage you're currently in. All three control relatively the same with some pretty fluid movement. Very rarely, if ever, do I run into issues with the controls. They each come equipped with the standard double jump and some basic combat attacks, but they also have unique attributes to set them apart as well. SpongeBob has the most diverse moveset with his arsenal comprising dominantly of bubble moves, which is very fitting for the character. Again, another small detail that I really appreciate. He's got a bubble bash and a bubble stomp for vertical based attacks, a bubble bowl for long range ground attacks, and even the cruise bubble, which is basically a homing missile. And my personal favorite move in the game. This thing is really fun to mess around with. Patrick can also ground stomp and has a basic attack, but he's also the only character in the game capable of picking up fruit or enemies and throwing them. And Sandy has a nifty lasso that allows her to grapple across large gaps, glide through the air, or take out an enemy from far away. The nice thing about this game is that all three of the characters are streamlined to play almost exactly the same, with minor differences differentiating them. It's super accessible and requires minimal practice to really get the control of the game down. Every member of the main SpongeBob cast is here as well. Squidward, Gary, Mrs. Puff, Mr. Krabs, Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy, Plankton, Larry, even Bubble Buddy is around to talk to you through various points in the game. Again, this all ties back into the faithfulness ideal that I mentioned earlier in the video. But a faithful game doesn't necessarily make it an enjoyable one, and this is where I really want to drive my argument home. There's more to game design than how it appears on the surface. It needs to do more than just simply looking like the source material. The game needs to function properly and provide a well-crafted experience for the player to immerse themselves in and be entertained. Thankfully, this game's design is brilliant in a lot of ways. In some cases, I'd like to think it was ahead of its time. Keep in mind that Battle for Bikini Bottom was developed all the way back in 2003, a time where many 3D platformers were starting to run their course and the genre as a whole was losing its popularity. Many of the games of this caliber were plagued with issues such as still having a live system, having to exit and enter levels each time you collect something, and in some cases, like say, Banjo-Kazooie, the fact that you could lose all of your collectibles if you died and had to start all over again. Battle for Bikini Bottom mitigated all of these issues by having no live system, auto-saving every time you collect a main objective or enter a new area, never kicking you out of a level after collecting something, and keeping everything you've collected permanently once you get it. In this game, as soon as you grab something, it stays with you no matter what, which I will admit is a feature that I tend to abuse from time to time. Some may argue this is a flaw, but I'd say it's more of an option. If you want to obtain something the legitimate way, then you can do just that, but if you feel like, say, speedrunning, then there's nothing wrong with that either. Bear in mind that it took Mario over 20 years before it decided to stop booting you out of its levels after you collected one star. Something that people were complaining about all the time until Odyssey came along. You aren't forced to choose a mission under the level, grab the spatula, leave, go back in, lather, rinse, repeat six more times. No, in fact, aside from one exception, every single golden spatula in each corresponding level is attainable the moment that you enter it. The designers knew that freedom 
was the best attribute a 3D platformer could have because they gave the player the freedom to roam around the levels and do almost anything they want. Minimal backtracking, another positive that I can give this game. Although backtracking in a 3D platformer isn't nearly as bad as something that's grind heavy like a RPG. Yes, there is sort of a linear design in how each level is navigated through, but you aren't required to collect specific golden spatulas. You can pick and choose whichever ones you want, so if one seems a little too difficult, you can just skip it and go to another. This is why large open world games have become so popular in the 2010s. And I'm not trying to say that Battle for Bikini Bottom is on the same scale as something like Grand Theft Auto V or Xenoblade Chronicles, but the levels certainly have a lot of nooks and crannies to explore. I think it's fair to say that this game is pretty easy overall, what with the abundance of checkpoints and warp boxes, infinite lives, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any challenges in the game. In fact, I can name quite a few missions that may provide quite the difficult time, but more on those momentarily. Oh, and another quality of life feature that I really appreciate is the ability to warp to any mission at any time just by pausing. So if you feel like quitting a mission and coming back to it later, then there is minimal penalty for doing so. This game is optimized very well when it comes to the freedom of the experience. I think what's most amazing about this game is that every single locale that you visit is a location that is seen directly from the show itself even if a few of the locations are based off of some more obscure areas. The game features nine levels, three major boss arenas, and an overworld, all teeming with their own little references and details that fans of the show would absolutely fall in love with. Every single level has plenty of connections to the show, whether it's the super recognizable rock bottom bus leaving SpongeBob behind, or something as subtle as Patrick saying, I don't speak Italian. Even the final boss rips out a set of anchor arms when the time comes because he's a jerk and everybody loves him. Dare I say Bikini Bottom is one of the greatest hub worlds ever made for a 3D platformer. It's simple, it's straightforward, you're not gonna get lost in it because it's super easy to navigate, all the while being full of plenty of things to do. You can visit Sandy's Tree Dome and engage in a battle arena, or go inside the interior of Patrick's Rock. Not once would I ever say that the Bikini Bottom hub world feels empty and lifeless because everything is super compact and close together. There are even a few platforming challenges challenges that allow you to find a permanent upgrade to SpongeBob's health. The only location I really don't like in Bikini Bottom is the Krusty Krab, if only because it's just another enemy gauntlet, which we already got with Sandy's Tree Dome. I was kind of hoping for something else, there's a lot of potential with this one. SpongeBob's house acts as the tutorial level of the game, which is about as ideal as a tutorial sequence could possibly be. Each room is dedicated to teaching you something about the game. There's the shiny object collecting, which acts as your basic currency, the room that teaches you about damage and health, SpongeBob's move set, and the golden spatulas, which are the primary collectible required to progress through the game. Also a reference to the episode Neptune Spatula, by the way. Other optional objectives include collecting all of Patrick's socks that are also hidden through the game, mission-specific objects that appear in all nine levels, or shiny objects which you need to progress through various points in the game or give to Mr. Krabs so that he can trade you some more golden spatulas. Why he can't just give them to me outright when there are bigger consequences at stake is beyond me but I guess he's just that much of a cheapskate. SpongeBob's health meter is based off of the number of pairs of underwear he currently has on, which I personally find to be extremely fitting for the character. It's truly incredible just how much this team went the extra mile to specifically designing even the most basic gameplay elements around the world of SpongeBob. I mean, they could have very well just given us a plain standard heart icon or something, but no, they decided to pick something that would fit SpongeBob's character perfectly, and it works. Even the currency is based off of the flower shapes that appear throughout the sky instead of generic looking coins and dollars. What makes this game even better than that is, if you already know these things, the game gives you the ability to skip past the tutorial with ease. One thing I absolutely despise is when I'm forced to sit through mandatory dialogue that wastes 20 minutes of my life away, telling me things I already know how to do because I've played the game several times before and yet it continues to treat me like I'm a baby. Thankfully, Battle for Bikini Bottom made everything skippable and the game doesn't treat me like I'm a complete idiot. Well done, Patrick. You're a real star. <laughs> Can I get a cookie? No.
This is one of the most player-friendly platformers I have ever witnessed in my life. And speaking of levels, all nine levels in this game each have their own mini story going on within the bigger picture, giving each area even more identity in the long run. At Sand Mountain, the robots are preventing everyone from going down the slopes. In Goo Lagoon, they stole everybody's sunscreen in an attempt to make everyone fry. Campers are being abducted in Kelp Forest. And Downtown Bikini Bottom even features the robots committing heinous acts of terrorism. Seems a little excessive for a kid's game, don't you think? The game starts you off in Jellyfish Fields, which serves as a solid introduction to many of the core mechanics. It's your typical green grass first level that sets the stage for everything to come and teaches you about a lot of the game's elements. Bungee jumping, sliding, teleport boxes, throw fruit, different tiki types, enemies, it's all there. It even ends with a giant battle with King Jellyfish at the very top of the mountain. Next up, you've got Downtown Bikini Bottom and Goo Lagoon, followed by Rock Bottom, The Mermelair, Sand Mountain, Kelp Forest, The Flying Dutchman's Graveyard, and SpongeBob's Dream to top it off. Yeah, needless to say, there's a lot of level diversity present here. I think one of my favorite missions in the entire game, though, is the Annoy Squidward mission. You can do this at any point in the game, and all you need to do is pay him a visit in his Easter Island head and jump around a bunch until he gets pissed at you. Okay, 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 just stop jumping, will you? I don't know why, I just think this is fucking hilarious. The narrator plays a neat role in providing a voiceover introduction for every level you visit as well, which is really cool. I tell you, it's the little things that make this game. I know a lot of players tend to find issues with Kelp Forest as being the worst level in the game, and I am inclined to agree. The lighting could definitely use some work because it is so incredibly hard to see anything for most of the run. The mission where you have to throw the three tiki heads on these stone buttons is also my least favorite mission in the entire game, mostly because there was this really difficult jump I was trying to make and I've been making for years, and only on this playthrough did I realize that there was a button you could press to make a leaf spawn. Man. I really wish I knew that earlier. That sliding sequence too has proven itself to be pretty difficult. At least, if you don't use this massive shortcut that is. I'd like to add that Downtown Bikini Bottom is also a drag for me early on in the game, if only because the level looks very washed out and dull for most of it. I don't know, it's just not as exciting as most of the others. Still, it's pretty cool you get to visit the Mermelair about halfway through the game. I used to hate both throw fruit missions for this one, but then I realized that all you need to do for the electric generators is just hit each one of them once. And hitting the three switches to fix the TV for Mermaid Man is easier if you go for the flipping platform path first. Once you get that one out of the way, the other two aren't that bad. You can also come across the invisible boat mobile, so again, another small detail I really appreciate. Although that rolling ball puzzle can go die in a fire. I beat it here just to prove that I could, but good god is that one of the more time consuming parts of the game. A lot of people don't like this mission and for good reason. Well, that and Mr. Krabs' mission in SpongeBob. Bob's dream. Seriously, this enemy gauntlet is next to impossible for any casual player. You need exquisite mastery of the enemy locations and character control if you expect to even come close to beating it. Or you could just use the tiki's that the developers conveniently place right off the edge here. Huh. It's almost like they knew this room was bullshit. Why even bother making it this difficult in the first place then? Don't ask questions you aren't prepared to handle the answer to. Whoa, calm down there, Mrs. Puff. My point in acknowledging the more infamous sections of this game is to illustrate that it isn't perfect. Just as every rose has its thorns, every game has its flaws, and this one right here is no exception. My personal favorite levels are definitely Goo Lagoon because of the pier section. Seriously, I used to love the carnival games. I used to play around this area all the time when I was younger, whether it was the spinning teacups or doing the bowling minigame. Sand Mountain is another one of my favorites because of the sliding sequences, although screw trying to get that sock in Flounder Hill where you have to destroy the eight snowmen. Seriously, I hate having to deal with that because that is like the only time in the entire game where if you die, you do lose your progress in collecting it. But those sliding sequences, man, so much fun. Oh, and SpongeBob's dream is also pretty fun too because of the wicked diversity in all of the dreams you get to visit. And again, Sandy's level is a sliding level, so that speaks for itself. 
Squidward also has a cool platforming challenge. Mr. Krabs has that enemy gauntlet that I already mentioned, and Patrick has an empty room, which I think is downright hilarious. It's actually really interesting because there was originally going to be this whole ice cream sundae level plan for it, but I guess it got cut due to time constraints or something, so they just put in this empty dark room with nothing but the spatula and Patrick. Personally, I actually really like this decision. It seems like it's meant to be a reference to how empty Patrick's dream was in the actual dream episode, Sleepy Time. The enemies of Battle for Bikini Bottom are also unique in their diversity. You've got the Hammer Dudes, the Lightning Cloud Summoners, Bombs on Wheels, Cowboys, Tartar Launchers, Inner Tubers. You can actually find out a little bit more about them at the police station, where every robot enemy in the game is given a little bio that have some pretty strange descriptions to them. Like this one that tells you to give a bomb to your enemies. That's a great lesson to teach kids. Honestly, the only enemy I can't stand fighting is Slick, the bubble blower, because it has this shield that can regenerate over time and takes multiple hits to defeat unless you use the cruise bubble on it. The boss fights are pretty good all around, some of the most fun parts of the game in fact. There are three major boss arenas and three smaller sub-bosses that can be found in a few of the levels, the latter three being King Jellyfish, Prawn, and the Flying Dutchman, which are all fun fights in their own right. But it's the robo-bosses where the game really shines, with Robo Sandy, Patrick, and SpongeBob each being present at the end of every major section of Bikini Bottom's hub world. All three of these fights are fun, creative, dynamic, and exciting because the fights are split up into three phases, with each phase changing up the boss strategy a tiny bit so you aren't stuck doing the same thing over and over again for all nine hits. Take Robot Patrick, for instance. The first phase, you just go up and hit him after he finishes his spin cycle. Fine, simple enough. But then phase two introduces the radioactive waste hazard, so now you have to navigate across these wooden crates to hit him. Then for the third phase, he fills the entire arena with the waste outright, so you have to switch to using your bubble bowl towards his back while on these conveyor belts. Each phase builds upon the last and gets progressively harder as the fight goes on. That's what's so simple yet remarkable about these. I love boss fights that adapt as the battle goes on rather than just doing the same thing over and over again for every hit that the boss takes. It's much more dynamic this way. The game is not perfect, however, and I've already pointed out a few of its flaws, but one of my biggest peeves with the game as a whole is that it has a serious case of random audio hiccups happening all over the place that I just can't figure out. Whether it's audio tracks playing in the wrong locations or the volume balancing just being all out of whack, I have no idea why some of these things occur. Even so much as the first level, Jellyfish Fields, has this one waterfall that you can bungee jump near that's just so excessively loud. It's impossible possible to hear anything when you get near it. Same thing happens with some of the flies around the manure trucks in Sandy's Dream or the falling rocks in Sand Mountain. They're downright ear bursting. Similar issues happen with golden spatulas where sometimes it doesn't play the congratulatory sound effect at all. The music itself though, 10 out of 10, job well done. There are so many recognizable level themes here that I absolutely admire. Whether it's the rockin' theme to the Flying Dutchman's Graveyard or the energizing battle theme, this is seriously worth giving a listen, even if you don't have any interest in the game. The only track that really feels out of place is Rock Bottom. Don't get me wrong, it's a very atmospheric, ominous piece, but it seems almost too creepy for a Spongebob game. And of course, it's impossible to deny the noticeable lack of Clancy Brown and Ernest Borgnine taking on their roles as Mr. Krabs and Mermaid Man. I have no idea if there was ever a reason given as to why these two never played their characters, but if anybody's found anything on this, I'd love to know. Knockback. Lord almighty does the knockback in this game get insane sometimes. I swear I'll make some of the smallest jumps imaginable, get hit by an enemy, and then just get sent rocketing away in the opposite direction. Yeet. Like, what just happened there? Again, this game isn't perfect by any sense, but in terms of the game's look, I think the graphics are great for the era that it was released in. Sure, the animations can seem a little weird in some places, I mean, Spongebob's arms tend to have minds of their own a lot of the time because he is not animated the same way he would be for the show. He's gotten almost 
Rayman vibe to him. The dev team also put in a bunch of cool idle animations that all three of the characters do when they're standing around doing nothing, although some of these can get pretty strange, not gonna lie. The characters are even programmed to run differently if there are enemies around, which serves as a good visual indicator in case you don't quite see an enemy on screen. I do think that some color correction is needed in a few of the locations to make the game seem more vibrant, seeing as I can't help but feel areas like Downtown Bikini Bottom and Goo Lagoon aren't as bright as they should be. Although thankfully this game never suffers from draw distance and has never been an issue for me. Although that's where the remake, Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated, comes in. I am so glad we are living in an age where HD remasters and remakes of games are actually good. It's incredible that with all of this live action cinema bullshit that Hollywood keeps pumping out, the gaming industry hasn't fallen to the same low. Genuinely good games are being remade all the time with modern graphics and tweaks from the originals, and everyone's loving it. At first I was skeptical of this remake, but as time has gone on, I've warmed up to it more and more. The colors are much more vibrant and appealing, the character models are on point, and most of the same iconic set pieces from the original are still there. THQ Nordic appears to be taking in a lot of fan criticism with the way the game plays because they seem to care quite a bit, and so far it looks to be that they have outdone themselves with this one. I am a little wary of how I'm going to get used to the controls because it does appear to play a bit slower than how the original did, but I guess I'll have to wait and see with that one. In summary, I highly recommend you check out Spongebob Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated if you don't want to go snagging a copy for the original. I really think that this game deserves all of the praise that it has been getting over the past couple of years. There's no denying this game has quite the legacy behind it, and I'm glad I got the opportunity to share my personal experience with it in this video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this kind of video, I know I certainly did, and I'd love to be doing videos on other cartoon-based video games in the future. Let me know if this is something you enjoyed enjoyed, what I could do differently, how it could be better, down in the comments below because I would really appreciate any and all input from you. I always try to make these videos the best they can be. That said, thank you guys so much for watching and have yourselves a fantastic day.